Alan Snyder, who is the Chief Gastroenterologist at the Children's National Health Systems, and he is actually the director of the Celiac Program at Children's. And I personally have gotten to know him, know, know him in the, over the past couple months, and he's a wonderful individual. So we're very fortunate to be ha having him lead the program. So without further ado, Jeff. Thank you very much for that introduction, and I want to thank all of you for um, coming this morning on a Sunday morning. Uh, we uh, really appreciate um, your support for the program, but also about all these questions that you're asking. That makes it great for the uh, speakers. Uh, we, we love to have this audience interaction. I'm going to talk um, this morning for a bit about the changing face of celiac disease, and uh, I'm going to, in this 15 minutes or so, I'm going to provide you a brief uh, overview of the basics very brief overview of the, of the basics and then the changing face and how that affects the, uh, our uh, appreciation of what's going on with the autoimmune component of the disease, uh, the diagnosis. I'm going to try to answer at least two questions for you. Uh, should everyone have a, have a biopsy now to be diagnosed and should we do genetic testing routinely on patients? And then I'm going to uh, close with uh, an update on what's happening with how we follow our patients. So first of all, the basics for celiac disease. Um, uh, is um, are summarized on the slide here. So it's a permanent intolerance to gliadin, it's, which is a protein, as you all know, that's found in three of the grass family um, grains. And it requires a predisposition of the genes for that person. And the injury that happens is caused by the immune system. It's a global problem, um, so you see the globe here. It, is, it, is, uh, it affects all parts of the world, and about 1% of the world uh, population has celiac disease, but only about 15 to 20% of the people who have the disease have been diagnosed. So the autoimmune pathogenesis, and the reason I'm going to talk about this a little bit today is that, first of all, I was asked to talk about it, but uh, also I think it gives us a little bit of an appreciation for um, how we can understand the disease, but also how we can think about ways you might be able to treat it better than using only the gluten-free diet. So it's an inappropriate T-cell response, so you don't have to be an immunologist to follow this talk, I hope, but you'll let me know afterwards uh, whether that was the case, but I'm not hoping that that's going to be the case. Uh, it requires a trigger. That trigger is this uh, alpha gliadin protein, which is found in gluten, and it requires, again, that predisposition of the genes of the person. It's strongly associated with an HLA region, a very specific region, and so almost everyone who has celiac disease will have either the DQ2 or DQ8 uh, alleles. And, um, but unfortunately, about 35% of the general population also have those alleles. Um, so it's not a very specific finding. And then uh, the gene uh, or genes, which is almost surely going to be the case that there will be a, a number of genes, uh, have not yet been uh, fully identified for celiac disease. So how does this work? Well, the gliadin protein gets taken up by the intestine, and it binds to this HLA DQ2 uh, item, this uh, area, this group of genes, and it starts an autoimmune process. And this um, facilitates a connection between two types of, of immune cells, antigen-presenting cells and T helper cells. Don't need to remember those, but just that there's two types of cells that get um, uh, connected, and that really is thought to be the central event. And that connection, once that occurs, starts a whole cascade of events that causes the injury to the bowel. And this is a, a figure that uh, sh that shows this uh, in a graphic way. And this this was published in 2002, but it's still a, a very fair representation of what how we understand um, celiac disease and its cause. So you see the gliadin protein here on the left. If I can get my, oh, here we go. Um, and it, it comes across the intestine, into the intestine, and it gets bound to this HLA DQ2 molecule. And that allows this connection of these two types of, of, uh, of cells, the T helper cells and the antigen presenting cells, and that a whole cascade is going to follow from that. And as part of that, uh, a group of autoantibodies are made. And also as a part of that, there are cytokines, which are proteins that are produced in certain kinds of white blood cells that affect the signaling in the cells. So the combination of those two factors, those antibodies that get produced and those cytokines, cause an injury to the intestine. 
So that's celiac disease, uh, in essence uh, of what we know now about the um, pathogenesis. So this cascade, uh, uh, again, includes the specific autoantibodies and these cell signaling proteins, and there's a strong specific HLA association. But this also overlaps with other types of autoimmune disease. And so, again, getting back to wh why are we talking about autoimmune disease today, too, a lot of people have difficulty understanding why celiac disease, which has this very specific inflammation of the intestine, how does that affect other parts of the body? And how is that linked to these other auto autoimmune diseases? So a part of that is that that genetic structure for people that have different kinds of autoimmune disease overlaps with what we see with uh, celiac disease. And an alteration in that response, that immune response, can lead to targets in other areas. So this altered uh, response uh, could be caused by differences in, in the genetic composition of that person, but also the sequence of events. So when did they start getting gluten? Uh, how often did it happen? How much did they get? But also maybe what infections they, they, they received or what other kinds of insults that they, they could have had. So there may be a, a, a big number of factors that play a role in that beyond the genes and beyond the gliadin. Uh, so just to think again, we have this um, uh, process that starts with celiac disease with this um, binding of the gluten and, and, and the and protein with the HLA uh, uh, DQ2 molecule that starts that whole cascade and uh, produces that uh, or facilitates that connection between those, um, those two types of, uh, of, of uh, cells, the T helper cells and the antigen presenting cells. But it's not hard to imagine then if the environment were slightly different, the, these autoantibodies that could produce by plasma cells may be different. There may be more than just those that attack the intestine. So a short example of that is the stomach. The stomach in people with celiac disease often has the same kind of inflammation that we see in the intestine, the same type of cells, of the, the, these inflammatory cells. So that's not really a part of celiac disease, but it's caused in people who have celiac disease, certainly not in all but it does happen. So it's not hard to imagine then that that's, that's a, a close by neighbor of the intestine, the stomach. But it isn't hard to imagine then that you could have a similar kind of process where those um, attack cells and these cytokines, these proteins that affect cell signaling, can travel through the bloodstream and they could go to the skin, they could go to the liver, they could go to the kidney, they could go to the brain, they can go to all of these other areas. So it helps us, I think, in understanding that this disease affects a lot of parts of the body and it all comes back to this autoimmune nature. So this is a slide I want you all to look right now. There's going to be a test in five minutes, and you have to pass it to complete. No, obviously not. This is, this is what they call a bad slide. But I, I'm using it for impact because, because I, I don't want you to learn all the different parts of it, although you're welcome to look at the slides later. But the, the point in this is that there are a um, 100 uh, or maybe more uh, facts that, uh, uh, that the way celiac disease can affect the body and can be associated with other autoimmune diseases. And this auto, autoimmune nature, again, with these shared uh, overlap in areas of the genes, uh, is going to be playing a very important, uh, important role in that. And as time goes by, we're, we're, we are appreciating more and more um, about the genes. Still don't know the exact ones, but that's going to be, that's going to happen, um, I think, in this next decade. But also the sequence of events. What, what's the injury? What are the, what's the sequence of injury that has to happen to develop celiac disease, but then maybe also celiac disease and hepatitis, or celiac disease and skin disease? Um, what makes those people different than the others? So the second um, changing face I want to talk about today is uh, on diagnosis. Um, uh, for now, the, the, first, the first level of diagnosis is done by serology. We need to know what the quantitative IgA level is, that type of antibody, because without that type of antibody, the tests that we use to uh, say whether a person has celiac disease aren't, aren't uh, accurate. And there are people with celiac disease who have IgA deficiency. It's increased in that population. And also in children that I deal with, uh, there's uh, something called a, a um, uh, temporary IgA deficiency that children can develop. So we always want to know for sure at the beginning, does a child uh, produce this type of antibody? And then the screening test that's used for uh, celiac disease is this TTG antibody, tissue transglutaminase, the TTG antibody. And it's a very easy test. It's accurate. It doesn't matter where it gets done. It's, it'll be an accurate test. 
The other uh, test that is a very good test, but I put in parentheses, is the endomesial antibody because it's more operator dependent. You need to know what lab is doing it. You, know, you need to know how good they are in being able to make, uh, to use that uh, diagnosis, but that also is a very good um, antibody test. And with a combination of those, the, uh, they have a, you have a very high predictive value for a person having celiac disease. So based on that logic that you could use serology, perhaps in a specialized way, you may be able to make the diagnosis of celiac disease without using biopsy. And this is a proposal from our colleagues from Europe, the pediatric colleagues in Europe, uh, to look at um, a, a, a series of factors to make a diagnosis without biopsy. The first is a tenfold or greater increase in the IgA TTG antibody. And these patients have to be symptomatic. Now you saw that other earlier slide, my bad slide, with all of those uh, types of um, uh, symptoms. Uh, in, in, in their paper, they listed at least 16 different symptoms, but it, it could be any kind of symptom. So they have to be symptomatic, and they have to have a tenfold increase in their IgA TTG antibody. And in their protocol, then, if the child had those two, two factors, then they would have an endomesial antibody done, and they would have HLA, DQ2, and DQ8 testing done. If all four of those factors aligned, they were all positive, that they would call that a positive diagnosis, a confirmed diagnosis of celiac disease, and they would recommend that the child not have endoscopy. So the first two questions, so, uh, first two questions that arise when um, you hear this, or when I hear this, is, uh, so how accurate is this? Uh, what, what, what are the numbers going to be uh, for children? And then the second question is, are we going to learn other things from the endoscopy that we wouldn't um, have gotten if we don't do the endoscopy? So to answer the first question, uh, how accurate is this, there was a paper published earlier this year by Butzner et al. from Canada. They have a, a big registry of children. In a three-year period, they screened 17,500 children for celiac disease, and they found 775 positive um, by the TTG antibody. And in Canada, if a child has a positive TTG antibody, they'll get the endomesial antibody done automatically. So they had all of those data. And they also do biopsies on these patients up till now, so they had that information also. They found 223 of those 775 patients who fit the criteria. So they were four, positive by all four categories. They had symptoms. They had a positive uh, tenfold increase in the TTG antibody. They had the endomesial antibody. And then um, they had HLA uh, testing done. Of those 223, four uh, were found by biopsy to be clean. They did not have celiac disease. So there was a 2% false positive rate. So if you're a statistician, you say, hooray, it's a great test, love it. Uh, only, only, we're only gonna miss 2% of the population. But if you're a parent or you're the patient and people say, well, I can give you a pretty good answer, but it's gonna be, you had a 2% chance of it being wrong. Um, is that going to be a good answer? So let me ask the parents in this audience, because we deal with children. Let me ask the parents in this audience, how many of you are going to take those numbers as being good for your child and you don't want, it, uh, you don't want a better answer? Anybody, anybody feel that they, they would like a better answer? So it turns out I'm a parent, and I would like a better answer because, again, this is good numbers, but if it's a 2% chance, um, you're, you're going to make a diagnosis for life for a child, which has a chance to affect that child's not only their diet, and, and you've heard of the psychological issues that can go on that can be a, a part of that, um, but also insurance and, and health care and those kinds of things going forward. So, um, so I think at this point, um, people in, in the U.S. and Canada feel that we don't uh, have enough information yet to say that this is going to be a way to supplant doing biopsies for celiac disease. Now, will, will, the, will the biopsies show other diagnoses? So um, these are uh, two studies, one from the group at Chicago by uh, Stefano Guandolini and his group looking at children, and these are children who met the criteria for ESPGAN, those four criteria that I just showed you, and but had biopsies done. And they found in, the, in that group, 10% of those children that had celiac disease also had other, other, dise uh, other diseases or diagnoses that needed to be treated. And in, in an adult group from Peter Green and his group at Columbia, uh, they did a similar look at people that met those criteria for having those, um, those four standards of, uh, for making the diagnosis of celiac disease, and they found 12% of those patients who had endoscopy had other findings that needed to be treated. So there's evidence that um, there, is a number of, there will be a number of patients who have other diseases that are going to be missed if the uh, endoscopy is not done. 
Um, so what about HLA typing? Should we be doing that on everyone? And so um, the HLA positive nature doesn't help so much. I already showed you that 35% uh, of the U.S. population, actually the, probably the world population, has either DQ2 or DQ8 alleles. So it's not very helpful if it's positive. It turns out it's also an expensive test. It costs in the thousands of dollars. And insurance doesn't cover it always. And so uh, families often have to pay for it if it's, uh, if it's ordered. Um, so those are important potential problems with using it, especially uh, if we're thinking of using it in a positive way. For negative findings, though, it is more helpful. If a, a child or an adult is negative for both of those uh, alleles, the DQ2 and the DQ8, their chance of having celiac disease is only about 2%. So it's a very low possibility. We have a couple of children that we follow at Children's who uh, are, are negative, and uh, they, uh, uh, they, they did not have either DQ2 or DQ8. So that 2% uh, holds pr uh, pretty much across the board. So the final um, aspect of the changing phase I'm going to turn to is looking at management or how we follow patients. So there are a lot of guidelines for celiac disease um, that exist, but effective long-term management programs are lacking, and there's little consensus on how best to follow patients. And so we hosted a group of six experts in pediatric celiac disease to review published studies and to develop evidence-based uh, best practices. So these were the experts. You've seen a couple of their names uh, earlier. You, you may know some of the others. But these are all experts in pediatric celiac disease that we hosted um, through our celiac program at Children's National. Um, so over 600 papers were reviewed. Each expert was chosen to summarize one area. And we uh, developed 33 best uh, practice issues to be evaluated. Um, the, the voting was anonymous on each of the questions, and a consensus was defined as having greater than 70 percent agreement. We found consensus in 32 of the 33 questions, and there was uh, complete agreement for 20 of the 33 questions. So again, you'll, you'll get the slides. This is busy, a lot of information. But just to say that we looked at these six different categories, and we asked questions in each of those areas. And we looked at the evidence that's available, and we also used um, expert opinion. Because unfortunately, there's not always sufficient data just to give you an absolute answer. But, but we've been able to put together now best practices in areas like uh, following up bone issues, uh, hematology issues, endocrine issues, um, also, also liver issues, nutrition, and testing. And we're about to send this paper off for publication. So in conclusion, um, I looked, I've looked with you at uh, a few issues here uh, related to the changing face of celiac disease. One is related to the autoimmune nature. And the key in this is that the, we're going to get a better understanding. We're, we're developing a better understanding. But that's going to continue to progress as we get more information on the genes and the genetic factors but also the understanding of the sequence involved of the, of the uh, accidents or the injuries that happen is also going to probably play a vital role in that. And then for diagnosis, serology holds promise, um, but I would say that at this point in the U.S. and Canada is still considered that endoscopy is the gold standard. HLA testing if, uh, can be helpful, but especially in the, in if it's negative. But even then, it's not absolute. And then the changes related to follow up, these best practices that we're developing, we hope will provide a more thoughtful framework uh, for uh, helping to follow children. So with that, I'll close, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much.